All right, welcome everyone. We're assembling to Sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And we're here for a special edition of our podcast. Yes. This is the ninth episode, but this is also a Ruby-centric podcast episode. That's right. As uh, Volume 5 is right around the corner. Right around the corner. (laughs) Uh, The 14th. Five days from now. Right. Oh my gosh, this is happening way too soon. Uh, but as that yes. is uh, happening, we wanted to talk about transitional arcs in storytelling, yes. specifically Ruby. Yeah. And what's the risk reward factor of them, mm-hmm. and uh, you know when they start and when they kind of need to end, so yes. that they can stop being a transition exactly. and move into a new arc. So this will involve things that we want to see in volume five mm-hmm. in order to make it just be a nice, pretty package. Right. But also talking a little bit about volume four in right. where it initiated this transition. Yeah. Uh, but before we do that, we want to shout out to some awesome people in particular. Hybrid mm-hmm. Thizzle, you are our newest uh, Patreon VIP member of the week to shout out. You are awesome. Thank you so much for yes. your support. It means so much to have people like you yeah. who are giving so much just to you know basically encourage us and support mm-hmm. us, but also get behind the scenes and uh, really interact with us in a community sense. Well so, said. Yeah. And also, yeah. in addition to that, so even <laughs> okay, um, we uh, we hit seven hundred patrons. Yeah, in fact, I think as of right now, it's around seven hundred and forty. So yeah. wow, thank you guys so much. Jacob's a little bit dumbfounded by yeah. the whole thing. I, I every once in a while, I'll be like, "Hey, Jacob, do you realize we're at yeah. this many patrons?" And he's just like. Oh my god, yeah. guys! You all are like, so amazing. Uh, like, like words cannot describe yeah, it. This it, this really this gives can't. us such joy to be able to consistently every day mm-hmm. make up new stuff for you guys. Yep. And just you know constantly think about okay, what's the next exciting thing we could do for you guys? Because yeah. we we love you guys so much. And of course, all y'all on YouTube are fantastic. But just extra special shout out for those of you on Patreon mm-hmm. supporting us. You're helping but us do, you know, the, you're helping the things us do what we, we want to really do. Want especially, to do. especially in this weird time with YouTube. It, it, right. It, yeah. it means a whole lot. So much. So much. Okay, so our schedule, Jacob. Yeah, so our schedule is going to be um, not quite changing up this week because, but you know, soon. Ruby Volume 5. Ruby is, Volume 5. When it goes onto YouTube, it'll be. Uh-huh. Yeah. But um, so we've got Tuesday, Hunter Hunter, mm-hmm. Wednesday, Psychopath. That's drawn up towards uh towards the end, towards the end. Like, it's getting really intense <laughs> yeah you, if you haven't seen that show you should check it out um and then thursday you know hunter, hunter, hunter again yep uh friday my hero academia yes yes uh, <laughs> then of course stuff. on saturday the last episode of ruby chibi yep and finale jojo's bizarre adventure yes and then finally and then, on sunday we have haikyuu that's right and then follow up with the podcast again on yes Monday. So. so guys uh it's really, it's really ramping up. Yep. It's, it's, it's getting exciting. <laughs> Particularly with Ruby, we have just watched the trailer. Our reaction to the Volume 5 trailer is mm-hmm. up. Be sure to check that out. But also, we are noticing that they seem to be setting up the next arc of storytelling now that they've all had right. characters begin to converge yeah. in Mistral. Yes. Uh, but this is the thing, though. They've begun to have characters converge. Exactly, they have but not they haven't actually brought converged. them back yet. Yes. Yeah. Um, like and- Team Ruby is still splintered up, which is fine. No, but, you know, there's still people like Oscar that haven't made their way all the way right. to the Team Ranger Junior dynamic yeah. yet. Right. Uh, and then, of course, there's the fact that what Blake's doing that hasn't really gotten to a point where it mm-hmm. feels like it's at the end of that little mini arc. So Exactly. You know, is she actually going to be, you know, coming back to Team Ruby soon? Even this volume. Or, yeah, even this volume. Like could we see Weiss and Yang in particular make their way back to Mistral sooner? Sure. And and get, you know, reacquainted yeah. with Ruby and such, but Blake's still in a It might take a while. Yeah. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see. But talking about arcs and transitioning mm-hmm. of story arcs we can clearly say volume four was essentially the transition arc right? absolutely yeah i was coming off of the high of volume three and now it's like okay right. let's set it up for the next uh, exact stage of this story yeah and that's where it separates itself from volume three is that the in-between time skip of volume three and four is not really the transition it's what the actual content right. is shown exactly. in volume four yes. That is that transition. Yeah, because anytime you do a time skip, you need to have some sort of recap to say, okay, this is 
what happened during the time skip. This is where the characters are at now. Exactly. Not just physically, but, you know, emotionally and all that stuff. Um, all right. But they also set up, in particular, things that mm -hmm. weren't completely resolved in Volume 4. No. Like Raven's character. Yep, talking the about whole things Salem were, group and everything. Yes, like, Salem's group. They had Hazel being sent off to Mistral, mm -hmm. but we never saw him actually arrive. <laughs> yep, we've got Watts at Haven doing his whole shenanigans yep, with we, Lionheart. We got introduced to Lionheart, exactly. Yep. Uh, we have also some, uh, some deals with each character from Team Ruby each on their own individual journey, right. essentially back to, not back to, but to back to Team Ruby yeah. by way of Mistral and mm -hmm. Haven, of course. Yeah. But then others where it's not going to be as, not going to be as straightforward, like Blake in particular. Right. And, oh, one other thing. Uh, they also did that bit of foreshadowing with uh, Ironwood and, mm -hmm. you know, everybody up at Atlas. Yep. Which like probably won't be focused on this volume because it's going to be you know more focused on Mistral and Haven and all that for sure. But that is another thing that um, yeah, it was be set up in volume set four, up in volume four. It probably for sure. isn't going to be completely resolved anytime right. soon, which is unfortunate because I would very much like to see more of Ironwood. Right. So Jacob, risks and rewards. What yes. are some of the benefits of a transitional phase of storytelling? Well. I would say it's not necessarily like the benefits of it. It's that you have to have transitional phases. Like ah, if, you, gotcha. if you have any sort of like climax that isn't at the end of the story, ah, then, good point. then naturally there will be sort of that lull afterwards. Even if you mm. do an amazing job of building and building, you know, like just all the way to the end of the story, mm -hmm. there's going to be those little, little breaks. Um, and it gives you basically a point of to be able to have that bit of reflection that makes the characters feel a lot deeper because sure. when when you have something really intense like you know the end of volume three how intense mm -hmm. that was um you need to see how that affects the characters that's a good you don't point. just want to see the stuff actually happen you want to see the aftermath that's a very good point um, and oftentimes we forget that those transitional phases exist because they happen, like in Ruby's case, on an episode-to-episode -episode basis. Sure. So they're very easy to just kind of pass by in an instant. Exactly. Yeah. I would say that kind of the formal dance of sorts in Volume 2 yes. is an example of a transition yeah. Yeah. towards the kind of the mystery events with Absolutely. Torchwick. And after the whole Atlas Paladin gone crazy right. amongst, yeah. amongst the city kind of thing. And I would say that's actually one of the things that like, so, you know, a lot of people had problems with, with Volume 4 saying it wasn't like as good as Volume 3, which, of course, you know, Volume 3 was Volume 3. But um, that's that actually is probably one of the ways that you can generally make transitions um be more well received is make it not be as clear of a break between okay this is the transition starting you know right um like like we had with volume four because volume four like was good it did a lot of stuff right yeah but because i think it was something that could be easily defined as oh yes volume four is a transition arc mm, a lot sure. of like i feel like a lot of people were were a bit like disappointed with that whereas if it had just been like some episodes here and there or if it had started in volume three and then like just bled into like parts of volume four maybe they wouldn't have uh you know reacted right. as negatively to it yeah and there's the whole aspect of them splitting the party and having yes. that be very difficult that was a ballsy to decision it's very ballsy and it's yeah. one of the things that i would say is it, it made volume three hit all the harder yes by it being that way yeah but that shows that they they were willing to take the risk for mm -hmm. that payoff Yes. And if you actually look at that in terms of an a causal effect, volume four had to be kind of a rough landing in order for volume three to hit so hard. Right. In that, and, in that area in particular. And that's kind of the whole point because exactly. volume three just destroyed everything. It like, did. And then volume four is like, okay, how do we piece this back together? Right. It's recovery. It's recovery. Yes, exactly. Yes. So it's, it's, it's not progress. It isn't really progressing a story of its own. Like it, it did have little bits and pieces of it. Yeah. But mainly, it's dealing with the aftermath because. Right. Which made it, I would say, a would. lot more character focused. Yes. Which was as nice. far as the volume goes, volume three was way more fight focused. If we think absolutely, about it. yeah. I remember being a little bit like, oh, okay, they're doing all these like tournament battles. Like, mm -hmm. but I would really love to see more things like the dance. You know. Yeah. Exactly. So we're we're going to have those moments. 
especially in Ruby, mm -hmm. where the story will kind of take a mini arc within an arc yes. of focus in a specific area. And Volume 4 just happened to be the transition one. Right. But the question now remains, yes. how does Volume 5 figure into this? Exactly. Because if Volume 5 is the part where you're saying it's not going to be as potentially clearly defined that mm -hmm. the transition is ending... That could be really good. It could be really good. It could also be a little bit, a little bit of a miss in some right. areas. Well, and I would say with this, like the, they need to bring uh, Team Ruby back together. They don't necessarily need to bring all of Team Ruby back that's together. That's true. If they want to I have agree. Blake keep doing her thing in Menagerie, that's great because we've been wanting to see a more proactive side of Blake for a while now. Oh, so yeah. if they do that, that'll be good. That will it. It will make her reunion with Team Ruby that much more worth it because she'll right. be coming back. Like after having done something, and it'll and it'll be that dramatic entrance, you know, and it'll be Ooh, fantastic. That's oh. true. In terms of the dramatic entrance bit, think of it as like a character reintroduction. Right. So yes, from yes. our perspective, it's not an introduction by any means. But to the other members of Team Ruby, whenever one of them comes back into the fold, it'll be like a character reintroduction. Yeah, because they've because grown since they've then. They've grown. Yeah. Even on a more superficial note, their outfits have changed. Right. Their you know their character has in grown some cases, their into limbs are something different, something you know. else. Yeah, that's that's also true. There are some very stark <laughs> visual differences between oh, where they wow. were previously and where they are now. Uh, but that's a that's a good point. If they choose to have each member of Team Ruby mm -hmm. rejoin with Ruby yeah. at different points in Volume Five, that mm -hmm. gives us a little bit of breathing time. Yes. In terms of a formula, I think that's a good formula. I like, you could give I like an that episode idea or two of yeah. breather time in between yeah. Yang, Weiss, and Blake coming back into right. the fold. Because that will, um, one, it will make it feel less contrived because it's not like they all show up at like some fountain at the same time. And <laughs> right. they're like, what are you guys all doing here? <laughs> that would um, be like the uh, Players in Pieces episode. Exactly. <laughs> Yang, but, Nora, look up! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but that will also allow more focus on how each individual person has grown. And that's mm, one of the, like, in the same way sure. that character deaths, um, one of the things that makes them the most impactful is showing the aftermath of it, right? How it affects the people, or, like, who knew the person that died. Yeah. Um, by reintroducing these characters in the way that, ways that they've grown and stuff. Yeah. Having it be able to be like a one on one or one on two or whatever, you know, the one person, like, say, Weiss coming back and people are yeah. like, wow, you're so different now. That will be huge. Right. Um, so so I really hope they, they do separate them by at least a little bit of time. That would be cool. Yeah, it, it kind of feels like it would be something similar to how the second episode of Volume 4 went with them all dealing of, yes. uh, with, with more particularly Ruby and Jean dealing with Pira's death mm -hmm. and us getting to see what that looks like. Right. Because in the first episode, they focused a little bit on it by showing Pira's armor being engrafted into right. Jean's and him getting the upgrades. But that was but more of just a nod. It's more of a nod, exactly. Yeah. But in the second episode, we get to see that Jean yeah. is in a very unique place and Ruby yep. is not strong enough to actually approach John in that context right. and talk about the whole thing until many episodes later yep. in the volume where they actually do have a talk about it and John's like yeah. Ruby I get it Pira's mm -hmm. dead and yeah. oh, they, that, that part was, to, that part was so good about it. That, that was really yeah. good so with Ruby volume 5 mm -hmm. I, I would say that I could see the transitional aspects of volume 4 bleeding into it a little bit Okay. But one of the yeah. things that I've heard being said in a couple of the interviews about Ruby Volume 5, that it's about, instead of just recovering, it's about getting back to 100% completely. Right. So it's not about going from, you know, 0 to 10% so you right. can actually have a, you uh -huh. know, an active battery on your phone. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. it's the thing of optimizing. It's the thing of getting yeah. uh, more effective. It's the right. thing of building yourself up and beyond 100% even. To actual actual growth. That that is there are Plus a lot ultra. of anime references I can make about that. <laughs> oh, a whole yeah. lot, yeah. Um, but uh, and and one of the things that is very um, promising about that is mm -hmm. that in order to show that people are you know back to one hundred percent or beyond one hundred percent, oh boy, um, <laughs> is you want to show them basically encountering new conflict or maybe old conflict and how they oh, handle it better sure. than they did before. Blake in Menagerie mm -hmm. is a great example of that. Yes. But we can also see that with other things like Yang meeting Adam again mm -hmm. or um, Ruby and Weiss like dealing with all the stuff that's going on in Haven. Like, because there's there's some stuff going down. Like Potential, this is, like, Ruby Cinder uh, yes, meeting absolutely. each other again. And that would be so good. 
and then there's also the stuff that will just be uh, I would say thematically different right beyond just being a a transitional storyline or even a new arc mm-hmm. but the tone of Ruby has uh, gone through a couple different evolutions here and there yes but I think that Volume 5 being in a completely new setting opens them up to do something that has no connection or ties to Volume 4 or 3 thematically. Okay, yeah. But actually feels like the the next stage of, say, these characters... Sure. Uh, ...being, becoming more, I would say, more adults than yeah. actual kids. And here's here's one way like that they could do that. So, um, Battle for Beacon was insane, mm-hmm. right? But yes. it was a battle. Right. I feel like in Volume Five, if they wanted to, maybe they just get into the start of this, and then Volume Six is yes, where they really. I know get what it you're on. about to say. Yep. War. War. Yep. War. Ironwood because, is almost basically the harbinger uh-huh. of it now by and, and, him kickstarting what they talked about in the world of Remnant uh, as being the initiator for yes. the war previously with and, uh, Mistral closing its borders. And by the way, I am so excited to see more of Ironwood doing that. Like, I would not mind at all seeing him go, like, full-on, like, Atlas dictator, like, it would head be, of a massive fleet. Like, It would be yes, interesting, because that, he mm-hmm. would probably believe he's doing the right thing. Well, and, and, in a, and in a lot of ways, he probably would be doing the right thing. But, but the consequences then, of it would exactly. not be yeah. good for right. the world in right. general. And, yeah. Uh, mm. Yeah. It's also, so good. Uh, another thing that they can bring up to kind of separate it from being a complete transition arc is introducing more characters that you can tell will remain in the main storyline. Yes. Like I would Ilya. say Oscar was the best example of this in Volume 4. Sure. I would technically say that Salem and Tyrion and all of them, you can tell that those characters will kind of flex in and out of the story yeah. as time goes. Salem will always be in the story, right. but she'll be kind of a, a behind-the-scenes yeah, presence. She's, yeah, she's so far into the background that you can't really see her as being... A in, character yet. A character yet, yeah. because she's she's not engaged in the happenings. She's sending out her minions, right? Yeah, and even her minions will come back every once in a while with a broken tail, yeah. and they won't be in the story for a little exactly. bit after that. Whereas Oscar is integrally weaved in very specific ways into the story. Yeah. And uh, his screen time in particular will be a marked change and evolution, I would say, as Ruby's story continues from a more transition storyline into something new. And uh, one of the things that I am very interested to see, specifically, Mm -hmm. is um, with... Well, of course, okay, Cinder, because let's be real, she wasn't really a character... Um, like up till up till she, like she was three. pretty one dimensional. She, 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 she had some motivations. She, but they she were had ambiguous. motivations, but she was she was uh, a lot like Salem is now, right? Uh, right. So yes. so that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited for that because now we'll maybe get to see Cinder a bit more on the front lines and more three dimensional. And yeah, and being more three dimensional, yeah. especially with that whole uh, you know disgrace the fire nation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but then also Ilya. I, mm, yes, Ilya. I didn't really care too much about the idea of Ilya's character um, when uh, we saw her in uh, Blake's Blake's trailer and that little bit we saw in Volume Four. You weren't you weren't kind of ready for the potential of her character well, at that point, like, or I I liked the idea, but it seemed it seemed like an easy sort of not that in. not that they actually would do this, but like a cardboard like token that they can place there that they might do something with, but mm-hmm. there was nothing there that told me. She was going to be really interesting, like oh, other than the fact that she was tied into Blake. Okay. But with but, that one line that we got in, oh, um, the, volume in the, five in the volume five trailer of you know your plan isn't going to work, Blake. I now I am really stoked to see what they do with her character. The voice acting on that line was that exceptionally was, good because that is conflict. That's it not is, just interpersonal yeah. conflict. That's internal conflict mm-hmm. that also ties into the main plot of what's going on. Right. So like. Like, yeah. Yeah, it could get really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the other things that's a huge aspect of transitioning between Mm -hmm. story arcs and even then, like, transitioning themes of story arcs Mm -hmm. is you get this kind of cognitive dissonance between your perception of how things should be and how they actually are. Okay. Uh, How do you feel like audience perception will play into Ruby Volume 5 in particular now that they've had a volume that maybe didn't meet expectations as fully right. well, as Ruby Volume 3 did? Well, I would say that that's been something that has been playing a lot 
like coming into play a lot just because volume three was so so insane and so epic yeah that we forget that maybe the first half of volume three wasn't as wasn't nearly as good as the second half and volumes one and two had were actually fairly similar to volume four yes like so volume three was the standout it was the anomaly but right. because it was so good people were saying like this is the quality that ruby's going to be doing all the time right moving forward. And, and they're also thinking that that's going to be the style of show ruby's going to be right all exactly the time going as forward. opposed to being some like cold, bucket of cold water on your head that just shocks you and then you're like what just happened and now you're maybe a little bit warier <laughs> right so now future. more people are asking questions like who's going to be the next character death well right. that isn't even necessarily a theme that right. could be huge in sto the ruby story moving yeah. forward Except right. for maybe every three volumes or something where they decide to rinse, repeat, and do it again yeah. in a more dramatic, horrible right. way. Now, of course, volume six is just even worse than volume three. Watch, now, 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 I happen. hope that they still kill off side characters, like because yeah, they should be afraid because, to kill off characters. Because if, especially if this is getting into the idea of war, mm -hmm. people die in war, right? Yeah. That that needs to be something that is that is felt. But yeah, it doesn't need to be like main characters all the time because also you know you only have. Ruby has a lot of characters, but you only have so many. And, yeah, you know. And it, it's hard to come up with these unique designs and stuff like that. That's true. And also there's, you know, what was it, that problem that <laughs> Game of Thrones was having where they killed off so many other main characters that the ones that were still there kind of had a lot of plot armor. Um, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> it's neither here nor there. <laughs> but that being said, uh, the point in which Ruby Volume 5 is clearly stopping being a it stops the transition mm -hmm. flow what what do you think will be the things we'll start to see happen like structurally well, i mean okay structurally yes I'll, I'll get to that in a minute but battle for haven just straight up like because they okay. they were hinting at that in they will not hinting they were they were foreshadowing like saying that's coming in volume four yeah, salem literally said says, like we're haven going to take next. haven next yeah yeah <laughs> um but structurally, I would say that we could get into more intrigue, possibly. Ah. Because they, they were hinting at that in the trailer. Yes. And since Watts is manipulating Lionheart, um, but, you know, no one else knows that, that, th th I think they need to have at least a little bit of that, even if they don't necessarily spend very long on it. Okay. So it's not necessarily just the characters getting back together. That's one aspect of it. Sure. But it's more of the direction the characters are moving and the culmination of a couple of plot points that were introduced in right. the transition volume of yeah. uh, four, volume four. Ooh, ooh, I, I, I got another uh, thing that I thought of. Mm -hmm. So in volume four, one of the things that they did was they were showing the theme that they're not at school anymore, mm -hmm. right? The world is kind yes. of a scary place. Yes, And they can point. continue that even more right. because it's not just the world is a scary place and apparently there are Knuckle V. Grimm out there, but... <laughs> Um, yeah. But there are there are like there are sinister figures in the shadows yes. that are that are doing some pretty shady and nasty stuff. It, they, these will be the kind of things that will make them long back for long for exactly. the times when in volume two exactly. they could just dance and John could be in a dress, and, right? Or they could just have a food fight, you know? Right. Like because I mean that line that Ospin gave was not at all After foreshadowing. All, this isn't a role they'll have forever. Yeah. Ugh. Okay, but, so I'm I'm looking forward to this. I could see oh, that I could see that it would take a little bit of time in the beginning right. to kind of get us all back into ship shape, kind of uh, very specific direction. But also this would be a great point to really solidify the adventure mm -hmm. aspect of Ruby yes. rather than being kind of the campy school training kind Absolutely. of Absolutely. I just have to point out that you said ship shape and <laughs> oh, I am I am one hundred percent aware of what yeah. <laughs> what I was what I was insi and, yes insinuating. And, yeah, and here's another thing that we need to see. Yeah. So since we are at a new school and a, a new place, a new setting, yeah, we need we're probably also going to be having a lot of world building as far as how like what True. this place is like True. because we spent three seasons at Beacon and Volume Four. It was basically just traveling on the road, yeah. right? But then there were those little bits with like Weiss's home and things like that or Menagerie. Yeah. Um, so. I think we are going to get, and and we should be getting quite a bit of that at least early on in the in the volume. Yeah. Because they need to make this this haven place really feel real. Get us get an attachment to this place if yes. they at all can, so that that way when it falls, because it will probably fall, 
um, it'll have it at least a will similar fall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. uh, that being said, also with world building, every volume of this show has evolved the lore of the yes. world in general a bit. Absolutely, a lot. And uh, volume four did some pretty crazy world building evolution. Yes, it did. With lore. So volume five might do some more things with regards to that through mm. the uh, introduction of a character who has merged souls with another young character yep. who will be a main character. Mm -hmm. Yep. I could see Oscar giving us some really interesting bits of info through his other half. I would like to see at least one discussion, like, like fairly lengthy discussion, just between Crow and Oscar, yes. just for the sake of having... Aaron Dismuke and Vic Mignogna. Yes, please. That would be fantastic. like Ed and Al, the Elric brothers united, just talking about stuff like, I, I they're they're going to drop so many Easter eggs. I get the feeling like just a little oh nods at <laughs> FMA, and I'm yeah. looking forward to those a lot. All right, that'll be awesome. Okay, so if you want to uh, get in on some of the Ruby action with us. Uh, this coming mm. Friday, yes. Uh, come back to this channel here. We're going to be having a live stream rewatch, very similar to what they're doing on Twitch right now. Mm -hmm. We're just going to go through all four volumes flat. It's going it to be, be ten hours of insanity. <laughs> yeah, we will try to hold all semblance of our sanity, <laughs> at uh, least for a little bit. <laughs> a little bit of it, and uh, we'll chat, discuss Ruby with you guys. Yep. And then, of course, the next day will be Ruby Volume 5's uh, premiere. So, yeah. yeah, get on our uh, Discord and uh, chat with us about Ruby. We, we'll be doing a lot of discussion there about uh, each, yeah. each episode as it, uh, mm -hmm. as it comes out. All right, so let's get into Q&A. Right. All right. First, oh, now, oh, one thing yes. to say. Okay, so one thing. Uh, there were a lot of awesome questions on the previous uh, week's podcast, but we just wanted to keep the podcast to you know a, a reasonable, a reasonable amount of time um so we limited it to 10 questions we it was yes. it was you know a bit tough but we we picked out 10 of our favorite questions right that so might, those are what we'll be answering yeah that might be a thing that we do more into the future as well so right. if you don't get your question answered here don't feel bad it yeah. might mean that your question is a repeat question that we get pretty often yeah so maybe check back on a previous podcast see if it's been answered also or, we don't do uh like have, like we generally really don't answer like have you seen this show questions yes because those are basically just yes no kind of things also we have a my anime list in the description yes. so you can check to see if we've seen a show mm -hmm. uh below there and uh yeah all right so, so q a of course we have at the first isotropy anime <laughs> yes. uh, because you asked so many questions you're, you're obviously first uh would you rather be able to create your own dimension and summon a portal to get in and out of it whenever you want or be able to teleport yourself instantly with no distance limit so which well, one that's pick? that's interesting because whenever someone says be be able to create, I'm like, wait, what yeah, are the yeah. limitations on what I can right. create? So I would obviously create my own dimension. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I even could, if it was just like a like a void, like a reality space or whatever, is well, basically what yeah, it is. I have all ever since I watched that episode of Fate Zero, I have wanted a reality marble, and I may it sounds or fantastic. may not do the Archer chant. <laughs> under my breath from time to time but uh so yeah. you would do the same thing <laughs> absolutely yeah i think teleporting myself instantly with no distance limit that would feels be fun great. but but yeah. imagine being able to bring your friends to your own yeah. pocket dimension like space. that that would be so awesome that would be awesome that would that's be the other amazing. thing is that summoning the portal itself allows you to bring other things and other people with you so. and here's another thing to think about if it is actually a separate dimension, mm -hmm. does time progress in the same way in this Who different knows? dimension? Like yeah. I've, I've read I mean, the Narnia books. Negative, well, yeah, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question. Daw five. How would you improve your favorite story or stories? Uh, there's a couple ways. Yeah. So yeah. usually for me, I would yeah. just improve the characters. I agree. Like that's um, most where most stories fall. I would see almost me. everyone would say that about their favorite stories. That yeah. there's that one character or those three characters where it's like, yeah, I would fix up this a little bit. I would focus a little bit more on that. I would mm -hmm. cut that out. That type of thing. But if I was to take it and go specific, a little bit of something like Avatar: The Last Airbender in particular, it's a favorite story of mine. I, that will be a short discussion. It will be a very short discussion, but I feel like there are a couple moments where the show kind of goes off theme 
sure. every once in a while yeah. for the point of just kind of filling in an episode. Yes. And something like, you know, The Great Divide or, or Avatar, Avatar Day, Day yeah. or even a little bit of Bato, The Water Tribe. Sure. Or, you know, Cave of Two Lovers. Couple, well, Cave of Two Lovers. I mean, I mean, yeah. The, come on. Now, now, this does not mean that we don't like these episodes. Except right. Except for maybe Great Divide. But, yeah, uh, yeah the, they, they just could have been strengthened up a little bit. Yeah, there's a couple things that I would switch up. Yeah. But okay. Yeah, that's that's the gist of it. Characters primarily, though. The, the one thing that I would do is I would, or the, the main thing I would want to do other than characters is I would want to make it so that the entire story is planned out from the beginning and has an ending yes. plan. There are so many times when I get mm -hmm. into some story and it's absolutely amazing, but they right. want to have it go as long as possible so they don't end up resolving it yeah. or it ends up just turning into something completely different. Yeah. Like, and I would... Ugh. Like, you can do That's so struggling. much when you actually say, we're going to end it here, because then you can just blow out all the stops when you're getting towards that point. Yeah. Um, and especially in anime, I feel like that doesn't happen nearly as much as it should. Definitely. So. Definitely. Uh, all right. Frosted Steel. When your opinions on stories differ greatly, what aspects of those stories do you think lend to your dissensions? Again, this is, I think, a character thing. Would you, sure. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah, um, it, it's generally the aspects of a main focused, a focused character of sorts that just doesn't fit within the story or they think actually pulls more weight in the story. Like we have a difference of opinion on something like Haruhi sure. because of our opinions on the characters right. in Haruhi. Yes. And certain ones basically being given more screen time or more development in a certain area where right. as... Yeah. You know, yeah. Usually, you just it, don't like. Usually, it's because of basically a difference in priorities. So, yes. a lot of the times mm -hmm. we 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 value the same things, but certain things will be a bit higher on the list than others. Right. Um. I remember getting really upset with Code Geass in the second season. Yes, I remember um, that. Yeah. And 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 like to be fair, I was very salty because some certain things had happened, and I was very <laughs> upset about that. But um, you know he, that. Yeah. I'll, he, I'll just say surely. Yeah. And any of you that have watched Code Geass know exactly yeah. what we're I, talking about. I am about. still salty, just a bit. Yeah. Um. So <laughs> that, that would be an example where uh, certain things in stories will get maybe a little bit emotional about, and that'll blow out uh, right. proportions our our. Our I would say that's actually the the that's story. that's actually uh, that that applies to Haruhi as well. Yeah, it applies because, to my because of Haruhi right. as well. Yeah, he, he had a bunch of negative emotions associated. I had a whole ton of positive emotions, so it just you know, yeah. Um, uh, Kulimbatov. Uh, oh, 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 hold on. Uh, Alabek. Oh yeah. Oh, Alabek Kulimbatov. Alabek Kulimbatov asks uh, favorite opening, opening and ending, ending in anime. anime. You first. Well, this is actually a really really tough question i know because one of the things that's interesting about openings and mm -hmm. endings is they end up basically being like ones that just actually stick in your head like it's not okay. about it's not about the ones that actually are like the best it's about those ones that you're just like all right i think it's time to get this down with low okay three, three two, two one, one let's jam, jam. Yeah, yeah yeah okay I, I think that's an aspect of it but one of the ones that chills me uh, to the bone. Now, help me out if this is actually mm -hmm. the opening. Okay. But the Madoka Magica opening, is that have the actual song? Are you thinking of yeah. Magai? No, that's actually the ending. Oh, that is the ending? Yeah, that's the ending that okay. they do after that episode. The ending... That ending of Madoka Magica... Yeah. Chills oh, me to it's, the it's bone. So good. <laughs> it's yeah. good. And the thing is, is... I remember so much like specific things about it, mm -hmm. but I don't actually remember the flow of those things, but I just remember the feeling it gave me. Sure. As far as openings, there's so many that just mm -hmm. kind of stick out. I want to go with Cowboy Bebop because it's just kind sure. of memorable. Okay. But there's so many others where I could go, oh, that part of that like is Steins better. Steins or Bacano or... I, Bacano was pretty high yeah, up there yeah. too. But I'll go with Cowboy Bebop because... Okay. It, all those parts where the high notes hit uh -huh. on the little crescendos. Yep. Oh, it's it's just perfect, and it's right. also stylistic, and yeah. It, so those are my those are my two. That. I gave you some time to think about it. Yeah, thank you. you I your, appreciate you that. your Black Lagoon one that you're well, gonna bring up. Here. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know me too well. I know and you and way by too the well. way, I'm not talking about the Black Lagoon opening. 
Mm -hmm. The Black Lagoon opening is amazing, but yeah. I'm talking about the Black Lagoon ending. Yeah. That ending, I absolutely love for a couple reasons. One, it is it is in stark contrast to the tone of the series. And you're so particularly talking about the music. The per, yeah, well, right, because there's no words in the Black Lagoon ending. Mm -hmm. um, the World of Midnight One was a great one, too, but specifically the Don't Look Behind, where it shows Revy just walking on the beach by herself. Mm -hmm. um, they also played the music in the episodes leading up to the ending which was great too because a lot of times in black lagoon there will be that crazy energy and then it'll be sort of that like yeah. somber like after stuff um and this this lent to that so well it had this great sense of foreboding and like oh mm. what's gonna happen next and i always wanted to just watch the next episode just but after i like watched just the ending all the way through um the, the other opening. now opening so this one is really, 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 really tough, and I'm still not entirely sure that this, I would say, is my objectively like favorite opening, yeah, but it's... because there's so many, but I want to give this one a shout out. Do it, yeah. Clan Ad. Now, oh, really? Now, yes. Now, okay. I haven't um, seen Clan Ad. You haven't seen Clan Ad, and I'm not in, entirely sure you would like the first season of Clan Ad, because it's... it's it has a lot of problems with it. Okay. Um, but, but, but why, why the opening The for that? opening... I absolutely love it so much because there's there's a part of it where they just go into like okay this character and their name this character and their name and I don't really like that part but in the beginning it is it starts out with like snow falling mm -hmm. and this little like robotic teddy bear kind of a thing getting up out of the snow which completely is not like the main focus of clan ad so it gives this great sense of mystery for one um and also okay anticipation of the second season i haven't seen the second season yet i'm going to but um because you're wondering like oh does this tie into that and then there's this part where it basically does this like weird like distorted sound and then it goes to um this little girl running through like a field of grass with this big smile on her face and I just absolutely love that part, and then at mm. the and then it goes through the character introductions, which is a little was a little bit bland, you know, part of the opening, but then at the end, it shows okay. one of the characters just disappearing and fading away, and cool. it's just like, oh yeah, it was good. All right, awesome. All right, so Little Duck asks, uh, also, or what would you say are the most important aspects on making a fictional world feel unique and something worth exploring to a viewer or reader? Oh, that's tough. That, that is really tough. I would say some important aspects you need to hit mm -hmm. that Jacob and I love to bring up is a character or main characters or characters, whatever, that care about yes. the premise of this fictional world. Yeah. Basically meaning that they are the driving motivation for us as the viewer slash reader to right. care ourselves. Yeah. Um. But something worth exploring is leaving uh, leaving opportunity for mystery and yep. asking well questions. Said. Well said. I would say just being bold enough to ask questions. Yeah. Too often in fictional stories, you just get a bunch of answers to questions you didn't mm -hmm. even ask or want to ask yep. and dumped on you at the beginning. That's why I would say there's a lot of uh, trouble nowadays with like when uh, people are basically, they make it some fantasy world. Like yeah. the whole transport into a fantasy world, there's a whole bunch of problems with that. But also when um, stories will make fantasy universes and they'll just rip off Tolkien because there's there isn't this idea of exploring it yeah. because you already know basically everything about the story right. like about the about the world you're in um, and again to just double down on what he said about making having a character that is invested in it because then you will want to explore it um, oh what? I just wanted to bring up something a lot of you guys have been asking us to react to the show made in abyss oh and that yeah. is a perfect example of this question right we haven't seen it we haven't but seen we have that. heard that it does this like to a t but like, not so only well. that just the premise is there's a hole yeah and people are wanting to explore the hole right, right. and and it's that's it's, that's it easy to communicate it's, it's a but mystery it's... characters that care about the premise yep there you go yeah that's it yep because yeah, because well I don't even know what it is, but that alone was enough for me to go. Jacob, we're adding this to the list. Yeah. He's like, okay, I was gonna put it to the list too, but yeah. all right, now it's doubly confirmed. <laughs> yep. Um. Okay, so Sean, Sean Kenny, Kenny, what are the elements that make up a good character death, and how do you recognize when you are making a mistake with a character death? Oh, mm. that's actually really tough because that I, is I would really say tough. by by its own definition, some people would have a mm -hmm. uh, an issue with my statement here. 
I, I so I'm actually gonna say not by its definition. I'm just gonna say this is Caleb's opinion. This is very uh, fast and loose here. Jacob might even disagree with me here. Mm-hmm. I would say most character deaths aren't good. That I would say almost no character death is good. It's about the idea that the character death is something that you're either building up to or you're not. And a good character death that you're building up to, kind of like those stories where the character has the horrible disease and it's about them living yeah. out their last uh, last bits of life before mm-hmm. they go. Every Nicholas Sparks novel ever. Exactly. Yeah. Or it's the ones from Game of Thrones where it's the shocking, brutal character <gasps> deaths yeah. and it's more about the actual, you know, visceral Did nature of the whole happened. thing. Yeah. I don't know which of those is good or not. The point is is that they they get by based on the lead up to the death itself. Or the aftermath. Or the aftermath. Yeah. And I would say the lead ups are for the ones that are for the shock. The you need the lead up for that because like with a horror movie, you want the jump scare to be all about the build up. The actual jump scare right. itself isn't scary. It's the yeah tension and the build up to exactly. it exactly that thing that makes you important. leave the lights on when you go to sleep exactly yeah. and then when it's a death that has been built up to a lot but you know it's you know it's coming and it's something more of a sad character death with the kind of nicholas sparks thing mm-hmm. going on um those are the ones where the aftermath is what hits you the hardest i would say yeah I would say in a and, different way. I, I mean, maybe well, that's just me. I, I don't know. I would say I would say every character death is different. So you can't do something as like a like a blanket statement for all of them. Yeah. Any rule in writing is meant to be broken. Yeah. Um, but like you can Except using good grammar. <laughs> sorry. Unless <laughs> yeah. Well, anyways. <laughs> but sorry. Um, <laughs> You broke my train of thought. Okay. Sorry. But uh, but with character deaths, I would say you <laughs> want it to. One, you need to be attached to the character. Mm-hmm. If you can be attached to the person that is actually dying, that will make it way better. That's um, a good point. A lot of times, a lot of times, people point. will ride completely on you being attached to the character that is attached to the person that dies, and oh. you can do that. But you are missing a punch. Oh. Mm-hmm. If you can make it so you care both about the character that dies and you know the the character closest to the person that died, um, then you. You're gonna get people like wrapped up in their blanket for six months on their bed, crying their eyes out, and just like listening to like you know like songs from the show, you know, if it's an anime again, or or just like re rereading parts of the book and just <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, Fault in Our Stars exactly. Yeah, uh, that that was an example of where a lot of friends of mine were telling me about it being one of the most perfect character deaths in a book that they'd read in a long time because of the build-up, but also the extent that they made you care yeah. about uh, this right. person. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not going to spoil it. It's a 50-50 split in terms of spoilers as to who right. it was. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. But yeah, that's a good point. So Jacob and I bring it up that there is no end-all, be-all good character mm-hmm. death, mm-hmm. but I would say a way to recognize a mistake is does my audience have enough to care about this character right. before they die? There was an anime, I think we watched like the first episode of it, and it was kind of ironic watching, and they shocked right. us with some character deaths in the beginning. But it was literally just the shock of like the way that they died, not the actual deaths themselves. Yeah, it's like, oh, didn't brutal care. deaths. And yeah. it's like, why are you doing this? Yeah. This, is, this is stupid. We so, don't want to say too much, or they might figure out what it actually yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. Um, but... And then uh, one of the other things I would say that's a great way to determine if a mistake is being made with the character death hmm. is the aftermath. A lot of times people... That's a very good point. A lot yeah. of times stories, especially in movies, because you have a small amount of time, right? Um, they'll have a character die, and maybe the person will be sad after it for a little bit. But then if you go 10 minutes later in the story, they seem to have completely recovered. And that is... Hmm. Again, it's a missed punch. It... If, it might not necessarily be immersion breaking because depending on how you do the story, you might just flow right, right through it and you don't have time to think about the, the person that died. Yeah. But you are missing a punch. 
Like, yeah. because it's it's the idea that now that person is gone. You need to build up, you, or you should, yeah. you should build up that idea that there is now a hole in the world, mm-hmm. or at least a hole in this yeah. character's there's, world. There's a particular death in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood and the original Full Metal Alchemist that yeah. some people would say is one of the best character Certainly deaths. Certainly one of the most iconic. So one of the most iconic deaths in mm-hmm. all of anime. Yeah. And I would say you don't have to go that far. That's an example of where they are constantly bringing yeah. up the fact that this character has died. But mm-hmm. if you're not, if you're not like at least making the effort to do something similar, I'd say it's a slight mistake because the the death might be a character where the instance where no one actually in the story cares about it. Right. But then I would say that's a waste of actual space for the story. Right. Unless Making that's what point. you're going for, that there's just like senseless things happening. Yes, all the but time. I would say but, this this is yeah. the kind of person that is wanting a good character death. Exactly. So yeah. this is this is where you're not just wanting to have like a war where you know hundreds of people are just dying. Exactly. Awful stuff, but like a singular important character death. You need to make sure that the audience and the characters care about them. So when they leave, there is a void left where they once were and the story mm-hmm. changes dramatically and people remember and it shows continuity and yeah. all that other good stuff. There are so many stories that I want to talk about right now that you haven't seen. I know. Good at that... spoiling it. Yeah. So let's move on to the next one. We've got Spectral Ninja's question. Mm-hmm. Uh, will you ever consider reacting to things outside of anime like cartoons, live action, movies, etc.? Or will you watch these on your own time if it is ever suggested to you? I have a few ideas on what to suggest you might enjoy. Short answer is yes. yes. We yeah. will end up reacting to some stuff like that. Yeah. In um, fact... Um, Rick and Morty was on the previous R- vote. Rick and Morty was on the previous vote. Um, Young Justice was on the previous vote. Uh, that's one that I'm campaigning for Jacob to watch, even though he is it. not as big of a superhero fan as right. I am. Um, but, and, and yeah, for, like, there are... Uh, what was it? Um, Chihaya Furu. I, I watched yeah. that because it was like I'd heard a lot of good things about it, but Westworld in particular. I figured it is wouldn't also, be Caleb's thing. Yeah, Westworld um, is also on our on our list of things. Uh, yes, uh, we both have not seen that. We're really excited to have that as like an HBO style show to watch sure. in between Game of Thrones, for instance. Um, what emotions do you look for the most in a story? What emotions so, are the most poorly handled mm, in a story? Whoa! All right. Oh. So. Whoa, that's a good question. That is such a good question. Um, I yeah, you take this. All right, yeah. So I I, I love to see um, the Whoa. idea, emotions of both loss and desire. Now, mm. um, and I don't mean like sexual desire. No, I like, mean like the yin and yang of yeah of basically have not and have not and want and to have and want to have like yeah. some of my absolute favorite stories or okay one of my absolute favorite stories that I will not mention here because Caleb has not seen it basically balanced the idea of um the the desires and the loss Mm. and they did it for multiple characters um at the same time and weaving them together and making it so that like say the desires of one character Mm. like took away the desires of another character i already know what you're talking about oh well okay (laughs) but i'm a smart person uh, yeah okay but i'm I'm not going to confirm it for you but anyways good good but um when you can do things like that it's awesome because again this ties into our idea of where a lot of stories fall short it's on the characters yes so getting into the emotions of what is that burning desire that this character has yes um and then and and what 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 was that line about like or that saying about uh, the the biggest tragedies are not the things that um, that happen but the things that could have happened and didn't right it's you know? it's basically the idea that uh, we'll go through life and we'll have all these things that we did and they'll be looked back with fond memory but one of the most powerful emotions we'll get is the thought back of all the experiences that we could have had but didn't right. because we weren't willing to make the choice exactly yeah um i don't know what the actual <laughs> line is someone posted yeah, yeah. in the comments yeah, yeah. but uh yeah, yeah so, the, so loss and desire okay i i really 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 love going into the whole i don't even know if it's an emotion but the whole thing of empathy Mm, um one of my real passions is connection and characters are just a little bundle of connections and then when you get multiple characters into a setting there's connections upon connections and it's all just so good Mm -hmm. but i really love stories where the 
empathy of a character is drawn out by the emotions of another character. Okay, yeah. So when a character like uh, Zuko is just an emotional just turmoil of and baggage then you have and Iro. crap. And then you have Iroh, whose empathy yeah. is constantly getting pulled yep. out by this kid mm-hmm. who just needs help. Like, yeah. Zuko needs some help, like well, some, well some, some, some trauma help and stuff. But then the moments where the empathy just is, oh, just brought out so delightfully. Oh, it's it's so beautiful. I, I remember those moments more than any other in any story yeah. ever. But and I would say the the emotions that are most poorly handled in a story is that kind of emotion that's supposed to invoke sympathy. I mean, not sympathy, empathy. Mm-hmm. But it just... It's just not handled well. I don't even know if there's a specific set of emotions that those are, but you can kind of think of it of those characters that it's like, oh, they're complex. They have right. you know a lot of depth to yeah. them, but I there's no say- actual emotion shown. Right. That's the stuff where it gets a little bit tough. Uh-huh. And I would say actually live action has a one-up on anime in that regard because you can get something where a character can display a myriad of emotions in two seconds with a set of facial expressions. Right. And it's just the actor reading in more mm-hmm. into the yeah. into the scene than maybe even they were supposed to. Sure. But we get all that out because a picture is worth a thousand yeah. words. But in an animated thing, there's a little it's, bit of it's, limitation. It's harder to do that. It's con- more consistent maybe. Yes. But it's, but it's harder to do that. Exactly. Um, I would say the emotion that I would say is I, I feel is poorly handled the most. Uh, I mean, it'd be easy to say romance, but... Um, but that's not an emotion. <laughs> that's that's not really an, an emotion, um, and this one isn't really either. But it's broken trust, basically. Any so actually, I would say that just be distrust, like uh, someone, or distrust, suspicion. Yeah. But suspicion, yeah, because like there there are so many times. Usually, this is in in episodic live action shows where it'll be like, oh, you know, this person kept a secret. Oh, but it was for your own good or something like that. You know, and and. And, like, that happens a lot. And so often, it just does not at all feel real. Like... It lands pretty flat. It's, it's like, it's cold water. I am out of the story and just... <laughs> and just looking at this cold and going, water. Like, what's going on? That's that's a great way to put it. You just kind of wake up from this dream. You're like, blah, blah. Yeah. Oh, that's true. I, I can't think of anything really specifically though so that's why i just brought up the stuff i did okay uh, um, Chow 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 uh if you hadn't watched avatar and you just discovered and watched it fresh now would you guys like it as much well no because no. we've watched it like 15 times yeah <laughs> there's that but i i would say also from a like mm-hmm. a, an objective sense no i don't think we Probably would not. because there's this nostalgic lens that we've attached to it just a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. by having when we, by having us be the age we were when we watched it. Right. I would say that there's a couple of things like that that it's hard to break out of. I think that's why there's a lot of Dragon Ball, Dragon oh, Ball absolutely. Z and Dragon Ball Super fans and stuff. It's nostalgia lenses. So us liking Avatar, there's a little bit of nostalgia. But I watched it or started watching it when I was 18. So right. I. I was yeah. more or less developed, I would say, as a mm-hmm. person yeah. at that time comparatively to the things that I watched when I was 12, where right. those have huge, mm-hmm. huge impacts on me now, and I know that most of them yeah. were crap. So <laughs> Right. And yeah. that just goes to show what a great show Avatar is. Yes. But, but yeah, we probably wouldn't like it quite as much, but we would still be pretty floored by it. Oh, we would. It would end up being our best our favorite thing in probably a year or two after we've introduced a bunch of people to yeah, it and probably. watched it a bunch more times. Yeah. And then a simple final question. Mikey asks, what are our top three favorite MHA side characters? Well, you know what? We have some new side characters to kind of pull upon because we, you know, we're, we do. We're a ways into season two. Yeah. And I, I want to say that mm-hmm. uh, in particular, the character of uh, Sue is becoming a much bigger uh, favorite of mine in terms of side characters. Okay, yeah. Um, the uh, the other two, though, I, I mean, wh- who would we say counts as a... Like, doesn't count as a side character? Um, Uraraka. 
Okay, that's a great example of somewhere where it comes close, but definitely Because not. unfortunately she isn't getting as much character development as we would like. But but that's but that's that's yeah. shown in stuff and right. we'll 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 get yeah. over that after as they get more development for other people as well. Um uh, I how about one for you? We'll go back and forth. Oh, okay. I, I might know all three of mine right now. Oh, okay. What are yours? Um, Invisible Girl, just because I love that design and I want to see more from <laughs> yeah. her character and, and make her actually like be a character because right now she's just a gag. Sure. Um, and then uh, two, Shinso. That nice. was one of the best about face turns for taking a, an antagonist, you know, very much side character. Um, yeah. I thought he was going to be a throwaway character and really... Hopefully he's like, not. Hopefully he's not. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love what they did with him. Mm -hmm. And then um, two, uh, it would be. Um, don't say it, don't say it, because I want to say it. Uh, Hatsume Mei. Good. Okay. Yeah. So my my one of my other favorite side characters is Aizawa. Just oh. Yeah, he's he's hands awesome. Down Aizawa, I love, I love, I love, I yeah. love this character. Yeah, he's he's pretty um, fantastic. Uh, the other, I would say, side character that I'm more and more starting to enjoy just mm -hmm. just you know a little bit is um well <laughs> no i'm not gonna say that character no i'm just gonna go with stain i i, I was gonna well, okay that's okay isn't that kind of cheating though it is like, kind of cheating like but that okay okay no i'll just i'll just go with it i was going to say momo because here's the oh, thing. Yeah. Here's the thing. Momo. I don't oh yeah, know that's a good point. I pro yeah, yet. I probably should have said Momo instead of May. Yeah, but but here's the thing. Momo. There's little bits where I'm kind of feeling for her character going through this portion in the, mm -hmm. you know, whole uh, internship part. Yeah. And I can see that she has the kind of true nature like the good natured heart of a hero yeah but she's having to come mm -hmm. to face the fact that it's a career it's not this idealized right. vision of what yeah. a hero is and and stain uh, is that rude awakening and that's why i think they're two sides of the same mm -hmm. coin um momo is kind of in that stage where she's realizing she's basically being used to sell products with a right. tv celebrity hero yeah and Stain is basically calling out people like that for being right. full of crap. Yeah. So I was going to say Stain because uh -huh. he's a way more compelling character right now. But Momo just 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 oozes potential. And that's a very funny pun now that I think about it. Yeah. Or a really bad pun now that I think about it. Um, yeah. Her um. quirk has infinite potential. Her character has near infinite potential. Mm -hmm. She is the smart character that hasn't done the... I'm a smart character trope thing since like the very, the very first beginning. time she really yeah. stood out in volume one. And one other thing to say about Momo, um, as far as ways to build sympathy for a character, what yeah. they're having her go through is awesome because one, it's creative. It's not something that you would normally like see right. in, in a show, but also since with something like my hero academia, we all would want to be able to go to UA, right? So the idea that Momo one gets to go to UA and two has this, amazing quirk right and is needing to be a tv like assistant yeah. pretty much and just be basically a cover girl for yeah a, like a product that or would suck that would sting that would that, that would hit you in the right in the kokoro right <laughs> <laughs> kokoro means heart by the way yeah yeah <laughs> It's just funny because I knew you were going to explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so that that's that would be my three. Okay. I, I would say that because those are my three, I can see them as being the ones that have extremely high potential sure. in the story yeah. for the future. Okay. And they're just not upgraded to main characters yet. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah. All right, that was some great Q and A. Yeah, uh, it actually did almost go for an hour, so it's a good thing we didn't do too many questions. That <laughs> yeah, regard. that would have been ridiculous. All right, guys, uh, you know, check out all the links in the description mm -hmm. if you want to hang out with us in our Discord. Go check out our Patreon, yes. and uh, we'll see y'all later. But until then, a semblance of sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob, and we'll see you all next time. time.